Hi, I'm Alex Weaver, and I'm here to talk about methods being utilized at the University of Florida for simplifying and speeding up at least a long arm wavefront error based total length noise simulations by expanding in the components of the source's wavefront error. Just quickly going over the structure of this talk. We first introduced how the wavefront errors in our initial beam to generate total length noise, highlighting the importance of these simulations. We then go over how uh, these, this total length can be modeled, highlighting the shortcomings of typical, typical modeling schemes. And finally, we introduce our resulting simulation technique that overcomes prior shortcomings and offers greater insight into how total length is connected to the initial wavefront errors. We touch on some insights already gained using this scheme before outlining what we ultimately wish to do with these simulations. First, going over where this noise comes from in LISA, LISA spacecrafts, uh, LISA requirements limit spacecraft in band generators to 10 nanoradians, along with 10 nanoradians of DC pointing this alignment. The nominal LISA beam is eclipsed Gaussian with no wavefront error. And so at the far field, we have a nearly spherical wavefront with length deviations between that wavefront and the actual sphere centered about the point at which the transmit spacecraft jitters, shown to be here on the order of 10 to the minus 5 picometers. Uh, and uh, transmits spacecraft jitters and rotates the far field wavefront over the receiving spacecraft and no deviation in received phase is shown, essentially. Uh, for our real beams, these include phase aberrations brought on by imperfections in the optical system. Current requirements restrict LISA uh, wavefront error or WFE to an RMS height of 35 nanometers. Uh, such an example is shown here. Uh, when propagated to the far field, the wavefront is now shifted off the sphere centered on our transmitting spacecraft center of rotation so that there's going to be significant phase and thus length deviations to the beam shown here out to 15 nanoradians. <clears throat> now as this transmitting spacecraft jitters, a different wavefront sweep across the receiving spacecraft location, moving this guy up and down. And uh, the change in length can be written to first order in jitter and DC offsets as the spacecraft jitter components times the probably angular far uh, angular derivative divided by the wave number of the light, which we rewrite in terms of the tilt length coupling components or TTL components. In our example, 50 picometers of phase deviation occurs over a 50 nanoradian far field cone, and so we expect these components to be on the order of 50 picometer of half a picometer of noise per uh, nanoradian of jitter, and so for Lisa, we'd expect about five picometers of noise. And so obviously this wavefront, uh, even for LISA wavefronts, there can be significant tilt length noise. So we require an accurate and fast method of recreating tilt length from general wavefront errors to better understand and thoroughly categorize the kinds of wavefront errors capable of generating significant tilt length noise with the hope that we can give mirror manufacturers some guidance and the types of deformations that need to be avoided. Of course, to begin with, we need a way of parameterizing our space and Zernicke polynomials are ideal as they're orthogonal over the uh, incomplete over the telescope exit aperture. We go through four through 36 here in the null indexing scheme, but we can readily adapt our methods to include all of them. And we write the phase as this sum here where these are actually scaled so that the A sub M here corresponds to the actual RMS height of that Zernicke's contribution to the wavefront error. We then go about calculating the far field phase, and that's done by, again, we introduce this e to the i5 for the initial uh, wavefront error dependence times eclipse Gaussian, and we propagate it with any of one of these methods. You can choose what you like, but these all require some numerical integration. And then uh, what we've chosen Fresnel diffraction, and then we take the appropriate angular derivatives. And the problem here is that there's those numerical integrations. Even if we analytically differentiate, these things can take hundreds of seconds. And uh, nowhere near fast enough for an extremely large simulations we have in mind. Um, and we had actually, uh, we tried every which way, and we did get some improvement speed with Hermie gauss based propagation of beams, uh, but only when we could analytically derive the uh, decomposition components, which only occurred when we expanded that e to the i phi to first order. And so we weren't sure how accurate that was, but this did bring up the idea that, okay, what if instead of going through that expensive numerical integration associated with the propagation, we just write the final tilt to length as a polynomial in the Zernicke contributions to the wavefront error. And how we do that, uh, we'd have our wavefront error as shown. Um, we recover, so we then propagate out uh, some generating set of wavefront errors and get the tilt length components using Fresnel diffraction for this generating set. And then writing out our tilt length polynomial expansion, and we've shown this here to set for a second order expansion, we then find these A and B maps that minimize the sum of the squared errors from the actual tilt length coefficients. And in other words, your typical least squares minimization scheme. And um, although this is done at each point in the far field, you want to recreate the actual tilt length like that. So these are actually mapped over a 50 nanorating cone. 
And as we saw in the no wave front error case, uh, there's like no zeroth order term here. So this guy should go to zero and is ignorable. And we illustrate how that's done in the linear case. We have some initial wave front error and we decompose it into its Zernicki constituents uh, with overlap integrals. Or in the case of simulations, we probably already had, we actually directly create these, um, these values of the coefficients. And when propagated to the far field, we're left with the effective contribution times the, the A maps that they become in the far field. And we recombine those A maps for the final uh, total and coupling, which we see here, we've actually shown the, uh, the 50 nanometer code and the resolution at which we've recreated these. And this does require initially simulating a bunch of tilt length uh, realizations so that we could effectively recover A and B. So for a second order, we need 595 initial maps for this to be uh, recovered efficiently. All of the, so 595 wavefronts all propagated to a significant number of far field points. Um, but and in order to get the A and B, the whole point being that once that's done, we never have to do it again. And now we can generate uh, total length estimates from any wavefront error in 10 milliseconds, essentially, is how long that takes. And how accurate are these? Well, uh, numerous simulations against unsimplified total length calculations using the Fresnel diffraction. And a thorough analysis of these maps has shown that the first order expansions are accurate for wavefront errors up to 10 nanometers in RMS height, while the second order should be uh, accurate for any LISA wavefront error. An immediate, an immediate benefit of the polynomial recreation is the transparency between Zernicki components in uh, the relationship between Zernicki components and the wavefront error that the actual tilt length they introduce. Uh, we can easily find the maximal magnitude of A and B maps uh, uh, using the maximal map magnitude of the A and B maps, what their greatest possible tilt to length noise contribution can be if we have 35 nanometers of RMS wavefront error and 10 nanometers of MVAN jitter. And that's shown here in these. So on this left here, we see uh, that only nine Zernikis can possibly contribute significant amounts linearly. Uh, these are these nine, they correspond to astigmatisms and defocus, as well as their higher order tertiary and second, secondary and tertiary equivalents. For the second order coupling terms, uh, it's not clear here. There's numerous ones that contribute. Uh, you can't really see here from this, but it turns out that there's no Zernikis that couple significantly quadratically. All the terms here that matter are cross couplings between different Zernikis and only 143 terms matter. And so we can actually drop all but those nine significant linear terms and 143 significant cross terms because the error in leaving out all other terms is insignificant. Uh, it can't even introduce that much noise. And we show that for over 78,000 wavefront errors here, where we've compared the error in leaving out all the terms versus not leaving out all the terms. Okay. And the whole reason for doing that is that it speeds up our simulations by a factor of four. Uh, but again, um, yeah, so 2.5 milliseconds per map, but either of these are extremely fast. And they're also very accurate. These are exactly the types of, this is exactly what we were looking at. These are the fast, accurate enough simulations that we can really thoroughly delve into how wavefront error is connected to far field total length coupling. And we've only begun to use this for that purpose. Um, so exploring out uh, how, what, what types of generalized requirements we can stay guaranteed meeting total length requirements. Um, initial tests showed, for example, having individual Zernicki contributions below 2.75 nanometers and cross contributions below 2.2 nanometers squared, we can we guarantee sub picometer level tilt length coupling, um, and that was over 700,000 wavefront error tests. But the reality is, is that that's most likely an unrealistic requirement on the wavefront error. After all, it inadvertently, with only using th up to 36, it inadvertently sets the RMS height of any wavefront error far below 35 nanometers anyway. And so in our current work, we seek more realistic constraints that are based on contributions of specific Zernikis within the wavefront error or cross contributions that guarantee either excessive or ignorable tilt length coupling noise. And more interesting, however, is the degree of symmetry exhibited by these maps. So we see some of the A maps here, the tilt length theta, tilt length theta maps. Um, and these Zernikis can be recombined. It shows that these are the original Zernikis can be recombined to form a new non Zernikis basis with two minimally coupling and one maximally coupling terms. So all of these couple a lot. We can rewrite this as three terms, one of which is significant, two of which don't really matter. And while that appears academic, the utility of it is that simple projections to the worst terms or the worst, let's say a bad subspace basis immediately dictate whether a wavefront error is inadequate for us. And it also makes it really clear what types of additional wavefront error need to be added in to cancel out 
the effective tilt length from some known wavefront error, essentially by moving into a minimally coupling subspace. Um, and we've already shown that that's effective for tilt length reduction in the linear case. Um, and because second order terms that matter are cross terms, we're investigating whether we can do use a similar subspace method for canceling tilt length coupling in larger wavefront errors. Um, that being said, we recognize mirror manufacturers have limited control over the addition of intentional wavefront error into the beam. And so whether or not such intentional wavefront errors can be generated, we can at the very least provide a list of coupling and cross coupling requirements of contributors to the wavefront error that guarantee insignificant levels of tilt length coupling noise are generated. Thank you for your time.